so welcome everyone to our Partners in Progress Connect webinar. My name is David Sherwood from EW Nutrition in Australia. Today's webinar is the first in a series of layer focused webinars and our speaker for today is Professor Doug Corbett from the University of Alberta. Doug, could you please introduce yourself? Thank you, David. Uh, I'm Doug Corver. I'm a poultry nutritionist at the University of Alberta. Thanks, Doug. Also, we have with us today as a panelist, Dr. Ajay Boyer, Global Technical Manager for Poultry EW Nutrition. Ajay, could you also please introduce yourself? Sure. Thank you, David. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining this webinar. I'm Dr. Ajay Boyer. I am Global Technical Manager for EW Nutrition. I'm based at US and I'm glad to interact with you uh, during this seminar. Over. Thanks, Ajay. So what we'll do today is we'll have uh, Doug Corbett's presentation. And after Doug's presentation will be a Q&A session. So please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to Click on the button and then you'll be able to type in your questions and we will attempt to answer all of them live at the end of the webinar or if we can't get to all of them live we will um, contact you via email later on. Also I'll be launching a poll questionnaire for some to gain some feedback for future webinars which will take about three minutes to complete. Okay so Doug Corver received a PhD in nutrition from the University of California Davis. Doug's research program has a strong applied research focus. Relevance to the poultry industry remains an important consideration in his approach to research. In addition to practical research on feedstuff quality and dietary supplement evaluation in poultry diets, Doug's work focuses on nutrition immune function interactions and bone biology in meat and egg type poultry. Doug currently teaches introductory animal nutrition and poultry nutrition courses at the undergraduate level and is a co-instructor for a graduate level course in advanced animal nutrition and metabolism. In addition, he has conducted field research trials in commercial poultry facilities in Canada, Colombia, and Ecuador. In 2016, he spent a six months sabbatical in Colombia, working with a major broiler integrator. He is currently part of the National Research Council's committee to revise and update the 1994 nutrient requirements of poultry. Doug, the floor is yours. Thank you, David. Uh, I'd like to thank EW Nutrition for inviting me to speak to you today uh, on pullet feeding strategies for successful long laying cycles. Now, we know that the industry is moving uh, towards longer and longer production cycles. This is in large part because of the selection uh, success that the primary breeders have had in um, selecting for birds that maintain production, maintain skeletal health, uh, and also maintain shell quality for a very long period of time. And so a lot of that increase in egg production has come by extending the length of time that the hens are, are in lay. So uh, currently it's achievable to reach 500 eggs at 100 weeks of age uh, as compared to 360 eggs in 80 weeks of age um, in the past. Now, if we're going to have this kind of persistency and this kind of success with our laying hen flock, we really need to start thinking about what we want to accomplish when we place the pullets at day of age, because it all starts with the pullet. Now, when we think of the pullet, we often, I think, as an industry, think of it, uh, think of that bird as a cost, as, as a, um, it really is a place where we can try and minimize our, our inputs, uh, where, you know, we don't have to pay as much attention because well, that bird is not producing eggs, and so we really don't need to start worrying about that bird until she starts coming into lay. Now, that is really far from the truth because everything that we do during the pullet phase is going to be reflected in our success in the laying barn. And so if we do a really good job, uh, we increase our chances of doing a good job in the lay barn. If we are careless and we don't uh, stay on top of things and consider what the bird needs, during the pullet phase, chances are those birds are not going to be able to obtain or, or, or achieve those long production cycles. Now, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this particular slide, but I want to point out that this is a period of immense changes starting at day of age and going to uh, the point of lay. And so we need to keep in mind what is happening with that bird. Why is that bird 
uh, putting on the tissues or trying to put on the tissues? Uh, how are they growing? How are they developing? And all along the way, we need to pay attention to what that bird is doing, what her needs are. Because if we don't pay attention to what her needs are, um, she's not going to be able to perform in the lay barn. So really what we want to accomplish with our pullet rearing program is to come up with a point of lay pullet that is going to be able to sustain those long production cycles. We want her to be able to have high levels of egg production, good shell quality, and maintain her own uh, skeletal health and welfare. So the point of lay pullet is really the key to long production cycles. And we can do a lot of things in the lay barn in order to sustain that productivity, uh, but it really starts with that point of late pullet. And so what I want to focus on today is how do we get from a day old pullet to uh, the point of late pullet ready to start producing eggs. Um, there's some basic management things that, that we can do. Uh, of course, weighing pullets is important. We need to be weighing pullets on a regular basis because if we don't know where those birds are in their growth curve, it will be hard to maintain the proper trajectory. And with laying pullets, it's very easy for them to get away from us in terms of being underweight, not being ready to come into production when we would like them to according to our schedule. And so it's essential to keep weighing those birds on a regular basis. And not simply weighing the birds, but also assess the flushing. Uh, the previous slide showed uh, a scale uh, a guide uh, to how you can assess the flushing of uh, your birds based on the amount of muscle covering the keel bone. Um, and so we're using those inputs, the, the pullet weights, and tracking those pullet weights over time. We're looking at the flushing in order to make our feeding decisions because the management guide will give us directions as to when we should be changing our diet phase one to another. Uh, but really, we need to be listening primarily to the, what the birds are telling us. The birds will tell us what they need, and we need to listen to them to make sure that we're feeding them appropriately. Now, target body weight is important uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, it's important because, as I'll, I'll speak more on in a few moments, um, it's important because it really sets the bird up to have the nutrient reserves to sustain uh, a high level of production and indeed to, to come into production in the first place. But depending on your egg market, if you're uh, marketing eggs based on egg size and there's a premium uh, for eggs of a particular size and above, um, pullet body size is incredibly important because small pullets will lay smaller eggs, which can have a huge impact on the economics of your operation. Uh, egg size will also have an important impact on shell quality. And so we need to manage body weight. And we don't generally have a problem with pullets being overweight uh, as they come into production. But uh, that can have a negative impact on shell quality. So we really want to stay on top of uh, the target body weight and target body composition. And the reason for this is because it's difficult to change that body, body weight trajectory once the birds are in lay. Now, uh, we know that birds, uh, the hens, will gain weight throughout the production cycle, but we can't turn a heavy hen into a light hen, and we can't turn a light hen into a heavy hen. And, and really what we're looking for is, you know, an appropriate weight uh, of hen. And so we need to make sure that when she's at the point of lay, she is where she needs to be because that is going to uh, influence her body weight and her nutrient requirements and also egg size throughout the production cycle. So really, we want to make diet changes based on the bird requirements, not on age. So the management guide you get from a primary breeder is a good document. It's based, it's got a lot of good information. Uh, but we cannot view it as the rule book. We can't view it as um, if the management guide says to change diets at this particular age, we must change at that particular age. No, we need to look at where the birds are relative to the development, uh, relative to the body weight, and relative to where they need to be uh, before we make our diet changes. Now, I'm going to talk more about feed intake and how to encourage feed intake uh, one of the things that can influence feed intake, particularly in hot climates, is uh, the, the feed form. Now, around the world, many producers use a, a mash diet. There's nothing wrong with using a mash diet. But the, the birds do prefer small crumble size. So if your feed intake is good, if body weight gains are, are appropriate where they need to be, um, you don't need to feed a crumble. If you're struggling with feed intake and if the birds are having trouble achieving their, their target body weights, 
uh, using a, a crumble is one way to increase the palatability of the feed and therefore increase feed size. So if feed intake is a problem, you may want to consider if crumbles are an option for your operation. Another thing that we can do is we can train the birds to eat more frequently. And again, this is something that if we want to accomplish a point of lay pullet that is prepared to enter production with good egg size and maintain high levels of egg production and good shell quality, uh, we need to start right from the beginning. So a feeding program that you can use uh, to encourage the birds to learn how to eat uh, more uh, is often called a stack feeding program. Uh, this is particularly useful in, in automated barns where you can set up the feeding times uh, rather easily. Um, early in life, you feed the birds uh, only a few times a day, uh, but as the birds get older, you gradually add more feedings. Uh, and this feeding, uh, the, the running of the feed lines or the, the feed hoppers encourages the birds to get up to, to consume some feed, and it encourages them to consume feed throughout the day. And by adding more feedings gradually as the birds get older, you can train them to eat uh, a larger amount of feed, eat more frequently, um, and particularly as the birds are approaching sexual maturity, that ability to increase feed intake, that ability to uh, be used to consuming feed throughout the day uh, is going to be important because of course nutrient requirements are going to go up substantially when they start laying eggs. So we weigh the birds on a regular basis, uh, two, every two weeks or, or sometimes even more frequently if that's possible, because we wanna keep a really close handle on where those birds are. Uh, if the body weights are below targets, we can add another feeding. So we, don't, we aren't limited to this particular number of feeding or this, this exact schedule, uh, but we can add in more feedings to allow the birds to build frame size. So once the birds are past about eight weeks of age and, and up to the point where they're transferred to the lay barn, um, we can add uh, additional feedings and again, uh, encourage the birds to consume more feed. Uh, once the birds are in the lay barn, they should be um, used to this. They should um, be, uh, well, their, their feed intake is going to be driven by their nutrient requirements. Uh, and because they've become adjusted to eating throughout the day, um, that will be a less uh, stressful transition for them. Uh, what are some other things that we can do if our pullets are underweight? And as I mentioned, we're much more likely to run into a problem with our layer pullets being underweight uh, than being overweight. So again, keeping in mind that we make changes based on what the birds actually require and not their calendar age, uh, we can delay switching from one dietary phase to the next. Uh, so in this example, uh, in this example, if we see uh, our birds are starting to get uh, a little bit below the curve, um, and when we notice that, we can uh, switch them to uh, the next diet at a later age. So we keep them on the, the earlier phase diet, uh, higher nutrient density phase diet, for a little bit longer period of time. And those extra nutrients that we're providing are going to be used by the bird to gain weight. Now, of course, the sooner we start to notice these birds are becoming uh, underweight relative to the curve, the sooner we can start to implement these changes. If we're waiting until they're 12 or 14 or 16 weeks of age, we're going to run into problems because that's going to be too late to really have a substantial impact. And in fact, as I'll show in a few moments, uh, we can actually negatively impact the, the health of the, and productivity of the birds. When the birds are stressed, so for example, with vaccination programs, uh, we can also switch back to an earlier phase if they're below the curve. So we don't necessarily need to um, think of dietary phase uh, changes as simply a linear operation. We go from the first phase to the second phase to the third phase to the fourth phase and so on. If the birds need a boost, we can switch them from the fourth phase back to the second phase if, the, uh, if that's going to help the birds gain some weight. So going from uh, a lower nutrient density diet back to a higher nutrient density diet can be beneficial to help those birds uh, get over a time of stress. We can delay photostimulation. Of course, this is going to be much more important as the birds uh, are approaching the normal age of sexual maturity. If we push those birds into production at too light a body weight, we're going to run into a lot of problems, and particularly in long-lived, long-cycle birds. We want to make sure that those point of lay pullets have the nutrient reserves that they need. And so if they're too light, if their body flushing, their nutrient reserves are not adequate to come into production, 
we should delay photostimulation. And so if we delay photostimulation, what's going to happen, that gives the birds a little bit more time to catch up to the target body weight that we want. And once they reach that target body weight, then we can photostimulate them and that's going to increase uh, overall productivity of the flock. Now, another uh, tool that can be used is midnight feeding. Um, midnight feeding can be used to, to maintain pullet growth rates, particularly in hot climates. What the birds will do is uh, when they're given an hour of light in the middle of the night, uh, they'll get up, they'll have a bit of a, a midnight snack. Uh, and what that does is it, it takes some of the feed consumption away from the hottest part of the day uh, and into a cooler part of the day. And so obviously uh, that is going to move some of the heat increment. So some of the, the thermic effect of feeding that's associated with feed intake. And it's going to shift that to a cooler part of the day. So overall, we can uh, see an increase in feed intake. Now, midnight feeding is a tool that can be used. It's not a required technique. So if your bird, uh, your pullets are achieving their target growth rate, um, or if they're, uh, if they're a little bit behind and you're able to overcome that using some of the other techniques I mentioned, uh, midnight feeding is not required. Uh, there are some key points, though, if you're going to use midnight feeding. Uh, you need a sufficient total length of darkness. These birds are still photoresponsive, meaning they will recognize changes in day length. Now, if, if we give the pullets uh, an hour of light in the middle of the night, and, it, and that's important, it has to be the middle of the night, um, if we give them an hour of light in the middle of the night, they do not perceive that as the start of a new day. So it doesn't affect their ability to respond to our, our phase changes uh, or our uh, photostimulation uh, later on. Now, if we start going longer than an hour, then we run the risk of affecting their ability to respond to photostimulation. And so I mentioned that this has to be in, in the middle of the dark period, and we want to make sure we have a roughly equal number of hours of dark around before and after that one hour period of light. So this is an example. This is, this is for layers. Um, and so you can see the, the, the day length is, is quite long, um, but you'll see that the, the hour of light is in the middle of the dark period. Now with layers, they're a little less sensitive. So we can have two hours of midnight feeding, but for pullets, we don't want to go more than an hour. And we want to make sure that we've got enough hours of dark both before midnight feeding and after midnight feeding. Now, the importance of monitoring body weight on a regular basis. Um, it, it, I've seen it happen where birds are underweight, 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 uh, and then shortly before the, the producer is thinking about photostimulating or, or moving birds to uh, the lay barn, they realize, oh, the birds are underweight We've got to do something about it. And through various means, they pour the feed to them, trying to increase body weight. Now, what happens is that during this period, um, you can achieve some compensatory growth in those birds uh, and get those birds to the right body weight at the point of photostimulation. However, when you do this, what you're doing is you're not allowing or not supporting the growth uh, of the tissues, the, the muscle, uh, of the oviduct, um, what you're doing is you're getting fat deposited. And so that is going to lead to problems in the laying barn because those birds uh, are not going to have the protein reserves that they need. They're going to come into production. Um, they're going to have uh, potentially problems with prolapses. Uh, they're going to have problems with egg size um, later on in the production phase. And so we want to avoid this. If the birds are underweight at that point, it's better to gradually get them up to the point where they need to be through delays in, in phase changes, uh, through midnight feeding, uh, through delaying photostimulation and, and other uh, uh, tools. Okay, so we know that when the birds are going to uh, start laying eggs, that requires a large increase in the nutrients to support that egg production. And so feed intake typically will go up uh, as the birds start preparing for egg production and as they actually start laying eggs. So one of the things that we can do to increase gut capacity is to adapt them to higher fiber diets. So we want to feed them a higher fiber diet that's going to reduce the nutrient density and encourage the hens to consume more feed. That will encourage 
uh, gizzard development. So um, early in lay, we can, or sorry, early in the pullet phase, we can start with a relatively um, lower fiber, still probably higher than, than uh, in many cases. Uh, and in the developer phase, so as um, sexual maturity is approaching, we can increase up to about 7%. And that's going to have a number of benefits. Uh, the pictures you see here are from broilers, but the, the principles remain the same. What's going to happen is that fiber is going to give the gizzard um, more to work against. And so what we will typically see uh, is better muscle structure in the fibers with uh, better, better muscle structure in pullets that are fed fiber than in uh, pullets that are not fed fiber. And that's going to stimulate gizzard contraction. That's going to stimulate gut motility. That's going to stimulate acid production by the proventriculus. And typically we see a beneficial effect on the gut microflora. Um, that acid tends to, um, that acid tends to uh, decrease the number of pathogens present. It has a positive effect on the gut microflora in terms of uh, providing fermentable fiber uh, for uh, the microbes. And often that fermentation is going to uh, have a positive impact on gut health. It uh, can also ha help with litter quality, uh, maintaining litter quality, uh, and also it's, a, it's a, a tool to improve bird welfare. Okay, so it's not common, but sometimes those pullets will be a little bit overweight. So if the pullets are overweight, what we don't want to do is say, uh, when we weigh our birds here, all oh, those birds are overweight, we've got to pull them back. Because in this period, if we're pulling nutrients away, if we're not um, meeting the nutrient requirements to allow for the development of body weight and body composition, uh, muscle development, over uh, reproductive tract development. What we're doing is we're actually sending a negative signal and what we want to do is continue to send a positive signal. So if your pullets are overweight, you're better off redrawing that growth curve to be slightly higher. Now that's going to cost you some in more maintenance uh, requirements for, for energy and for nutrients. Uh, but overall, your produ productivity is going to be much greater if you redraw that curve parallel to where it should be, so higher but parallel. Um, overall, that's going to increase productivity because sending a negative signal just before the birds are coming into lay uh, is going to cause problems with uniformity. Some of the birds are not going to um, be able to respond to the photostimulation cue. So when we're feeding pullets, frequent weighing and fleshing is important. We can delay the diet phase changes if the birds are underweight or if there's insufficient muscle development. And we can implement strategies to keep the birds at or even slightly above the target body weight. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the birds being slightly above target body weight. We don't want them to be fat. We don't want them to be excessive, uh, excessively large, but slightly above target body weight uh, is fine. We can delay photostimulation if the target weight is not achieved, and that estrogen surge is going to depend on the body composition and the body uh, and the age of the bird. So we need both in order for the birds to respond to photostimulation. Now, another factor that is really important with pullet development is you want to give those birds enough time to deposit medullary bone before their first egg, because that medullary bone is going to support eggshell formation. And if they have inadequate stores of medullary bone, uh, they will increase the use of their structural bone and that can lead to bone problems. So really what we want to do with our pullet feeding program is we want to use management and, and our feeding programs to get all the birds in the flock to what I like to call the starting line. So we want everybody lined up at the starting line and then we use our photostimulation cue in order to get all the birds to start production at the same age. And so uh, we want to have a uniform flock. The more uniform flock, the better, because in reality, even though we're feeding uh, the entire flock of birds, we're assuming that their requirements are that of a single bird. And so if we have a non-uniform flock, the, the wider this curve is, the more birds we're going to have at this end that are bigger, that have greater nutrient requirements that are going to be ready to come into production sooner, uh, and we're going to have a greater proportion of birds at this end of the curve where uh, these birds are not ready to respond to photostimulation. So if we feed and if we photostimulate, assuming all the birds are here, we're gonna have a lot of birds that are, are not ready to start laying eggs. And we're gonna have a lot of birds that have higher requirements 
um, and will probably start coming into production even before we photostimulate. So again, we want to get all the birds at the same time in the same condition to the starting line so that they all start from the same point and they can get through this long uh, production cycle um, maintaining high productivity. The other thing is we want them to be prepared to start at the same time. So even if they're at the starting line at the same time, or even if the starting signal that, uh, that photostimulation is given at the same time, uh, we need to make sure that the birds are all prepared to respond. Now this is important because the more uniform the flock, the faster the birds will come into production and uh, the more precise we can be in making our diet changes. So I'd just like to point out, um, as the birds are coming into production, when the birds are laying at 40% on a flock basis, really what that means is there's over 60% of the birds that are actually laying eggs because early in production, of course, in an, ind an individual hen is not going to lay an egg every single day. So because at 40% production, over 60% of the birds are in lay, that means that over 60% of the birds have the nutrient requirements of a laying hen. So even though productivity is not quite there, the flock is ready to uh, need those extra nutrients. And so if the birds don't have the body condition that they need to come into production, or some of the birds don't have the body condition to come into production, what we're going to have is a lag in reaching peak production. So uh, in a uniform flock, those birds will come into production very, very quickly. They'll reach a peak quite quickly, uh, and then they'll gradually tail off. Now, this is an older figure, and so the, the persistency is not as good as modern laying hens, but the principle is the same. So when we have a non-uniform flock, birds are going to come into production very slowly. Uh, we need to make sure that we're meeting the nutrient requirements of those early producing birds. So we have to feed the flock uh, a higher quality diet, a more expensive diet. Uh, but even those birds that are coming in late, um, we're not necessarily giving them the nutrients when they need it. And overall, what we see is a loss of egg production, particularly in here. And that's where the birds are laying um, very rapidly um, at a high rate of production. And so there's a lot of lost profit if we have a non-uniform flock. Uh, just a word about prelay diets. Um, prelay diets should not be used to feed the bird into production. Prelay diets should be used to get the last little bit of preparation into that bird. Uh, so the bird should already be at a, its mature body size, meaning it's not going to grow in height. Its skeletal size is set. It will still put on some body weight, of course, uh, but we, sh we shouldn't be trying to get those birds to grow uh, in height. They should already be at their mature body uh, height. And because of this, very little nutrients are actually needed for growth. Now, there is some nutrients required for reproductive tract development, and of course, calcium and phosphorus for deposition of medullary bone. But a prelay diet is not required in order for medullary bone to be deposited. Now, if you use it properly, the prelay diet can be helpful. Now, it's important to use the prelay diet with very, uh, with a lot of caution. And the reason for this is the prelay diet really is only suitable for a very short period of time in the life of the flock. There's too little calcium to support egg production, and so we don't want to be feeding the prelay diet well into the production uh, phase uh, after the, the hens start laying, because it's not going to support eggshell formation, and the birds are going to have to use bone calcium. And what I've seen happen in the past is, um, again, we need to listen to what the birds are telling us. And what I've seen happen in the past is that there's some prelay diet left, the birds have started laying, um, and at that point, you need to switch to a start lay diet or a phase one lay diet. And that's essential because if we're continuing to feed prelay based on how much feed is left in the bin, rather than what the birds uh, need, that cost savings by using up that diet that you've already paid for, uh, you're going to lose it in productivity because you're going to lose production early on uh, when those birds run out of calcium uh, and they'll uh, either come out of production or they'll have a, a drop in egg production or a drop in shell quality. Okay, so we've got now to the point of, uh, point of lay. Uh, so the pullet is just about ready to start laying. She's approaching sexual maturity and hopefully 
uh, we've done everything that we need to do. So why is that point of blade pull it so important for the rest of the production cycle? Well, we know that those birds are going to gain weight. Uh, protein and energy in uh, stores in the body are going to go up. Uh, egg size will go up. Now the, the, the breeders have selected for a very slow rate of increase, but it still is a rate of increase and we need to recognize that. We know that structural bone reserves will go down and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, momentarily. So the structural bone reserves will go down and one of the big things that we need to do in managing the laying hen is managing that structural bone. Now the medullary bone, as I mentioned, which is uh, the reserves that are used or are intended to support egg formation actually go up. And I've seen cases of cage layer fatigue where there's a lot of medullary bone and in spite of that, uh, the structural bone has been uh, reduced to the point where the bones break very easily. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about how that happens. And we know that uniformity is likely to go down over the life of the flock. So we really need to make sure that uh, at the point of lay, we've got that hen in the best possible condition or that pullet in the best possible condition. Now what happens if we have uh, a pullet that's been brought into production too soon? And I, I'm not talking about age or number of weeks, I'm talking about too soon relative to having the appropriate body size and the appropriate body composition. Well, when we bring pullets in at too small a body size, uh, typically what happens is they don't have enough energy in the diet to, or energy reserves to sustain production. So that the flock comes into production quite well, they reach uh, a good peak, but they don't have the nutrient reserves to sustain that. And because they haven't had a chance to build up more reserves as they get older and get, get bigger, um, they don't have the nutrient reserves to, to sustain production. And so often what we'll see is a little post-peak uh, check or a post-peak dip. Now that doesn't mean that the birds are going into a molt, that doesn't mean that the birds have completely gone out of production, but essentially what they're doing is they're taking a little bit of a break from production uh, they're regaining some of the nutrient reserves, and once they've got the nutrient reserves, then they come back into production. But they never really reach the same level of production. They never maintain that same uh, persistency, and that's through the life of the flock. So these, these little mistakes that we can make early on can have a huge impact on the overall productivity of our flock throughout the life of the bird. And this is why we want to manage those pullets to be at or even slightly above the target body weights, um, I mentioned the effect on egg size, uh, particularly in markets where uh, there's a premium on egg size. Um, and also we wanna make sure that uh, those first eggs that uh, the birds lay, which are typically smaller, um, reach uh, an appropriate size as quickly as possible. Again, uh, this relates to pullet size. So pullets that come into production at a smaller body weight are going to lay small early eggs and they're going to continue to lay small eggs for a longer period of time. So getting that body weight up is a first step, um, an essential first step into uh, to, to getting early uh, egg size where we need it to be. Now, start lay diets. I mentioned that the calcium levels in a pre-lay diet are not sufficient to sustain egg production. Um, and so if we look at 5% production, uh, there's a large proportion of the flock that is actually preparing to lay an egg within the, the next two weeks. And that increases the need for calcium both for medullary bone formation, but also for the formation of eggshells when the hens start to lay. So if we look at uh, 18 weeks of age, um, those birds in a well-managed flock might only be, laying, uh, only be laying at under 10%. But by 20 weeks of age, they could be laying up to 83%. And it's those two weeks where medullary bone formation takes place. And so that two weeks is really important. So we need to make sure that we're uh, using a pre-lay diet. If we're going to use a pre-lay diet uh, for the appropriate period of time to allow the bird to develop uh, good medullary bone stores, or uh, if we're going to switch right from a developer diet to a start lay diet or a phase one layer diet, we want to make sure that we're, we're switching uh, early in the, the process, um, probably before 5% production so that we're meeting the calcium requirements of the, the flock. Okay, I like to, to think about this as how to make a ch chicken skeleton uh, because what we do during the pullet phase 
is going to affect the skeletal health of the hens throughout the production cycle. So at the point of lay, those maximum, the, the structural reserves are going to be at their maximum. And because of the physiology of the laying hen, the skeletal structural bone reserves can only decrease while the hen is laid. She is in lay. She will not replace structural bone. And so bone quality problems are always better prevented than they are treated. And so we need to keep that in mind. Now, if we look at the, the structural bone of a laying hen, the cortical bone is the outer shell of the bone. And this provides much of the strength to the bone. Um, the trabecular bone are the inner structural components. So it's these, these uh, trabecular struts inside the bone. We can look at them in a slightly different way. Uh, so this is a humerus, this is a wing bone from a laying hen, and you can see these struts. Uh, these struts allow for uh, the, the skeleton to be very strong, but also very light. And you can see them, uh, these are, are ashed bone samples from uh, one of my grad students. But you can see how the structural bone uh, is, is quite actually um, limited compared to a mammal of the same size. So, and that's an adaptation for flight, having a, a strong but light skeleton. So the cortical bone and the trabecular bone make up the structural components of the bone. And as long as the hen is in lay, she will not replace structural bone. Now the medullary bone is the bone tissue that's deposited. Uh, it starts being deposited shortly before the onset of lay. Um, and in here, this, this figure, you can see it. Um, this is a, a, a hen at her first egg. And it's this really dark staining material here. Uh, and if you were to ash the bone, you can see it forms this spongy material. Now, the medullary bone doesn't provide a lot of strength to the bone, but it does support eggshell formation. And so looking at it uh, a little bit different way, uh, we can see that um, this uh, trabecular bone here in an out of lay or immature bird uh, is, um, is, is present. There is no medullary bone present. If you look at a bird in lay, we still see those trabecular struts but now we see uh, medullary bone deposited in these very small spicules. So the medullary bone is like the calcium bank account to support shell formation. Uh, the hen can deposit, uh, deposit the medullary bone when she's not forming an eggshell each day, uh, and then at night when she's forming an eggshell and dietary calcium supply may be limited, she can use the medullary bone. Again, once the hen starts to lay, the structural bone is not replaced, but the, the hen continues to use medullary bone, but also structural bone. And that's where we run into problems uh, with long laying cycles in particular. So the hen can replace medullary bone, but she does not replace structural bone. Uh, so this is a, a body weight curve for a flock uh, of two different strains coming into production. You can see body weight gain increases fairly rapidly from 12 to about 20 weeks of age as the bird is preparing for sexual maturity. Now at 16 weeks of age, before the bird starts depositing medullary bone, you can see good thick um, uh, cortical bone, good trabecular structures. Now when the bird is approaching sexual maturity, so from about 12 weeks of age up to uh, about 20 weeks of age, the bone expands in diameter, and it expands in diameter. Um, here we are. It, it expands in diameter very quickly, and density drops. And the reason that happens is become because the bone becomes much more porous. And you can see that uh, the pores in the the, the cortical bone um, take place uh, or are formed because the bone is expanding so rapidly um, that the expansion happens and the, the pores that are formed can't be filled in by structural bone. Now the medullary bone is deposited. It's deposited within those pores and it's deposited on the structures surrounding uh, the, uh, uh, the structural bone. Now this is important because the greater the proportion of eggshell calcium that comes from the bone, the poorer the quality of the shell. So another way to put it is, if we can get those birds to use more calcium directly from the diet rather than taking it from the bones, the shell quality will be greater. Um, and over time, when the birds are excessively relying on bone calcium, uh, we tend to see problems with eggshells. Uh, and over time, we tend to see problems with, uh, with bones as well. 
Now, EW will be sponsoring a, a seminar, I believe it's next week, uh, looking at feeding laying hens through 100 weeks of age. So I'm not going to focus too much on it, but I just want to um, emphasize the importance of pullet bone development because if we have that point of lay hen or pullet with good cortical structure, good trabecular structure, and a great extent of medullary bone deposition, um, we can maintain high levels of egg production for long periods of time because we know that over time, the birds are going to lose structural bone. So this is at 67 weeks of age, never mind 100 weeks of age. Uh, and you can see how thin the cortical bone structures are. Uh, the trabecular bone structures are very uh, thin as well. And we have medullary bone actually uh, throughout the, the medullary cavity. So we need to make sure that the pullet at this point has the most extensive, appropriately um, deposited structural bone and medullary bone to sustain her through long production cycles. So with our pullet nutrition program, we want to make sure that we're, we're uh, maintaining or preparing the pullet for sustained high levels of egg production by maintaining the target growth or even slightly above during the pullet phase. We can delay the phase changes if needed to get the birds to the target pullet weight. We can delay photostimulation to get the birds to the target weight before we photostimulate them. And we can manage the timing of the increased calcium. So that medullary bone development starts between 10 to 14 days before that first egg. So we need to make sure that the birds are getting the calcium at that point. We can use midnight feeding. Um, so there are tools that we can use to get those birds to the point that they need to be to start production that will set them up to sustain high levels of egg production. So we need to think in the long term, and we need to think in terms of what will provide the greatest return over the life of the flock, and that means bird health, bird productivity. And we don't want to get in the trap of thinking, how do I get my hens into lay as soon as possible? That was a bad idea before we started having these long production cycles, and it's an even worse idea now, because if we push those birds into production when they're not ready, they're simply going to crash. So think of the pullet as an investment and not a loss. The, the work that we do in the pullet barn will pay dividends in the laying barn. The status of the point of lay pullet is the pinnacle. In a lot of ways, it's downhill from there. So particularly as it relates to bone quality, uh, we wanna make sure that the birds have excellent bone quality coming into lay. And managing the hen from this point on is often just as much about maintaining the work done in the pullet house as it is to try and fix things or do things better now that the birds are providing a return. So thank you very much for your attention and I believe we uh, will be spending some time answering questions. Thank you, Doug. That was uh, very informative. And as you say, uh, we need to get it right with the pullets because uh, we have a short period of time to, to get uh, that part of the operation correct. And they're going to be with us for a long time after that. So that they are really uh, an investment in the future. So um, yeah, we do have uh, quite a few questions coming through. Um, there's been a couple on, uh, on midnight feeding. Doug, uh, one was asking uh, at what week can we start midnight feeding uh, it would be in pullet feeding. And then uh, another question on, can we do that in layers as well in older birds too? Sure. Yeah, so um, particularly if it's if the weather is, is quite hot and you're concerned about feed intake, um, you can start uh, earlier. Um, so for example, um, six to eight weeks of age. Uh, if, um, if you notice a little bit later on that the birds are starting to lag behind, uh, you can implement it. So uh, unfortunately, there hasn't been a lot of work done looking at the best time to implement it, or is it too early? Um, but, but the results, the results that I've seen in the field, uh, midnight feeding can be started uh, probably as early as six or eight weeks uh, of age. Now, the next question was, can you do that with laying hens? Yes, you can. Um, and laying hens, can you can go up to about two hours uh, in the middle of the night. And again, you need to have sufficient numbers of, number of hours of dark, both before the midnight feeding and after the midnight feeding. Um, so typically if you've got, uh, for example, a one hour midnight feed, uh, put it in the middle of the dark period and have an equal amount of time before and after that. Uh, and same thing if you go to two hours, put it in the middle of that dark period so 
uh, that there's a as long as possible a dark period before and after. And if you do that, the hens will not recognize that, that hour or two of light as the start of a new day. If you go much longer than, um, than two hours, then it the starts um, uh, affecting the bird's ability to recognize when a new day is starting uh, and you can run into problems with uh, uh, eggshell formation. We have one here on uh, relating to light. It's uh, from Cheryl. Um, how many lux is the light requirement during delayed photostimulation? Uh, I would have to do I have to do some checking. Um, the birds are actually very sensitive, um, so uh, I would uh, I would follow the management guide instructions. I know that they are very sensitive to light. And so, for example, um, I've, I've been to a barn uh, in Canada where they were having problems with birds starting to lay too early. And what we found the problem was, was that there was a, 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 uh, a fan where the light trap had fallen off. And so just that little bit of light coming in uh, through that fan was enough to photostimulate some of the birds that were closest to that. So, so they really are quite sensitive. Um, in terms of, of the number of locks uh, to use, I would uh, go with what the management guide recommends. He's asking what can we do to ensure uniformity as it is so important. Sorry, could you repeat the question? You I think David's uh, video is uh, audio is getting, getting disrupted. So what I would do, um, I would take uh, from Bob Sweek. The question is, what can we do to ensure? David, I I will take the next question. Is that okay? Okay, that's fine. Yes, thank you. Yeah. So the question is, uh, with high fiber diets, how recommendable is the use of enzymes, mainly amylase and xylanase in pullet diets? For instance, the fiber value was given like 4.5%. Mm -hmm. yeah, so so I think... So uh, I think uh, sorry, Ajay, go ahead. Uh, I said I will answer this question, Doug. Okay. Yeah, so this is this is about the enzymes. Um, so basically, if you look at uh, these two enzymes, amylase is for starch digestion, and uh, in the corn soy diet, uh, I think we have uh, sufficient amount amount of amylase and but um, starch. So by using amylase, uh, it definitely helps to in, improve the the energy of the feed. Uh, as far as xylanase is concerned, uh, this is for the anti-nutrients like arabinoxylans. So xylanase will act on arabinoxylans and it will also help to improve the uh, energy content of the feed or availability of the energy. But I think the one of the big advantage is related to gut health if we use xylanase. It will have a positive impact on the gut Content viscosity and digestion and overall gut health. So yeah, I think uh, it is a good idea to use uh, these enzymes in the pullet diets. You may want to ask next question, David. To Doug. yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. There was a question from Bob Swick which is uh, how do we ensure, what can we do to ensure uniformity as it is so important? Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's always the, the, the question. Uh, if you have the labor um, grading, 
So going in and separating uh, your pullets into different groups and feeding those different groups differently, uh, recognizing that the bigger birds can sort of follow the normal trajectory, the smaller birds uh, might need a little bit more um, higher nutrient density diet. That's a labor intensive solution. Um, many parts of the world, labor is not an issue, but uh, in, in um, uh, a lot of areas that labor is um, a big concern. Uh, one of the things that you can do to increase uniformity is encouraging those birds to eat more frequently. So as they get trained to consuming more feed throughout the day, um, really what you get is less competition taking place um, at the feeders. Um, now, we don't have the same issues with competition in, in layer pullets as we do with, um, with broiler breeders, but stimulating activity, the, the hopper going by or the, the feed line being run more frequently encourages the birds, just that activity encourages the birds to get up, become more active, look around and, and get a bite to eat. So, uh, so that's one of the things that, that we can do to uh, encourage uniformity, um, environmental management as much as we can, making sure that the uh, birds are not backing away from feed because it's, it's just too hot to eat. Um, midnight feeding, also giving them another, another opportunity uh, to, to get at the feed, um, encouraging those birds, train those birds to eat, um, is another way that we can uh, increase uniformity as well. And then a lot of it comes down to management. So if we've got hot spots and cold spots in the barn, um, if we've got lighting, um, problems with lighting uh, throughout the barn, um, you know, different uh, light intensities in different locations, particularly for caged birds, that can be uh, an issue as well. So, so there's some environmental things that we need to be looking at as well as feed. Doug, one more question, uh, very interesting question related to uh, photo stimulation. Will delaying photo stimulation reduce the total number of eggs a hen will produce? Uh, the short answer is no, and that, that might seem uh, counterintuitive. But what happens when you force birds into production too soon is you shorten their productive life. So if the birds are not ready to start laying eggs uh, physiologically, now they may be able to respond to photosimulation, they may be able to start laying eggs, but those few eggs that you gain at the front end you're going to lose weeks and weeks and weeks of production at the end because those birds are going to go out of lay, uh, they're going to go through a molt or they're, they're going to, to die. Um, so it might be tempting to start photostimulating those birds early or start photostimulating them at the normal time, even though the birds are underweight. But what you gain in those first week, the first week or two, you're going to lose uh, later on. And what we saw, um, 10, 15, maybe 20 years ago now, uh, many of the, uh, the primary breeders were introducing early maturing lines of laying hens, so birds that would start laying eggs very early. Those lines are no longer around because what would happen is they'd start laying eggs, they'd come into production early, and then they'd run out of, they'd run out of nutrients essentially, uh, and they'd stop laying eggs. So yes, they started lay early, but they couldn't sustain production. So manage the birds, to get them to the right condition before you photostimulate them. And that's how you're going to be able to reach 100 weeks or, or beyond 100 weeks with high levels of egg production. So sure, you lose a couple of weeks or a week of egg production early on, but you're more than gaining back that lost productivity at the end. Okay, I have a question here from Mehdi Togiani. And the question is how to prevent pullets from depositing fat, especially when a low density developer diet is fed. So how to prevent the birds from getting fat? Yes, so how to prevent pullets from depositing fat, especially when a low density developer diet is fed. Right, so this is why managing body weight and fleshing is important. So if you're picking up the birds, if you're weighing them, if you're looking at development, um, the birds should not be getting fat, particularly on a low nutrient uh, density diet. So that, um, 
that shouldn't be an issue. Where, they, where we run into problems with uh, birds depositing fat is if we've got an improper uh, balance of energy and other nutrients. So if we've got too much uh, fat, for example, um, relative to uh, what the birds need. So if we've got a low, so for example, if we're using fiber to stimulate gizzard development, yes, we will probably have to add a little bit more fat in order to, uh, in order to um, balance the energy. If we're putting in excessive amounts of fat and the birds are not getting enough protein to support body development, um, or if we're overfeeding on protein and the birds are simply deaminating the amino acids and converting it to fat, um, that might be a, uh, an issue. But normally, if we're feeding a balanced nutrient uh, and energy uh, diet, uh, we shouldn't run into those problems with the birds developing excess fat. Doug, there is one question related to pre-lay diet. Do you okay. recommend using a pre-lay diet? If you can use it effectively and correctly, then yes. Um, where I see a lot of problems is particularly uh, with small producers. Um, so producers that don't normally get frequent delivery of feed or uh, mix feed frequently uh, if they're mixing on farm. Um, and really what it comes down to is making sure that we're feeding what the birds require at a particular time. So if, uh, if, we can, if we can predict our feed intake, if we can predict when the birds are going to start laying uh, and when those birds need to be switched to a high calcium diet and order feed or, or manage the feed accordingly, then pre-lay diets work great. Um, if the temptation is that we've got half a bin of, of pre-lay diet left but the birds are already at 10 or 12 or 15 percent production, but we're just going to feed out the prelay diet. Well, that's a, a, a recipe for disaster. So um, we need to make sure that we're feeding the prelay diet only for a short period of time. And once the birds start laying, we need to switch to a high calcium. So again, when that first bird, when that first egg appears in the barn, depending on uniformity, we've got a huge proportion of the flock, maybe up to 80% of the flock, that's going to be laying an egg within the next two weeks. That's when they need those calcium, uh, that extra calcium is in the two weeks to 10 days before an individual hen lays the first, first egg. egg. So if we're starting to see eggs in the barn, we need to be starting to think about changing from a pre-lay diet to a start-lay diet. And if you can do that, then pre-lay diets are great. Start feeding uh, if you know your flock, if you, if you know when those birds are going to respond to your photostimulation, you know they're on target weight, you know that the fleshing is good, start feeding a pre-lay diet two weeks, 10 days before the first egg. When you see the first egg, switch to a start-lay diet. Yeah, there is one, one more interesting question related to midnight feeding. Can we apply midnight feeding in layer breeders during laying period? Uh, I don't have a lot of experience with layer breeders, but I don't see why not. Um, they should respond physiologically the same way that uh, that layers would. Okay, we probably have time for another couple of quick questions. Um, one here from Fajad Zadi is how to fatty liver in peak production by interchanging fats with carbohydrates? Yeah, that, that's a good question. One of the main things that we want to do um, with preventing uh, fatty liver is making sure that we've got um, adequate uh, methyl donors. Um, so uh, we want to make sure that we've got uh, choline uh, or betaine or other uh, methyl donors in the diet. Um, we also um, Yes, we want to make sure that uh, uh, that the birds are not um, over reliant on on uh, lipid synthesis by the liver, uh, and so yeah, we can um, uh, we can uh, change uh, our fat and our carbohydrate proportion as the birds get older. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just looking at the the question here. I've lost it now. So uh, here we are, interchanging fats with carbohydrates. So yeah, um, changing the proportion of fat and carbohydrate as the birds get older 
um, is, is one of the ways that we can manage that. Uh, also very important, the, uh, the, the methyl donors. So the, the choline, um, the uh, betaine, methionine. Okay, thanks, Doug. Uh, thanks, RJ. We actually have run out of time. We've uh, still got a lot more questions there, but we will get back to everyone via email. So um, I'd like to thank you all for attending and for your questions. You can email us for any further questions on our webinar topics using the address webinar at ewnutrition.com. A recording of this webinar will be available on our website tomorrow. In a moment, I'll launch our poll questionnaire. Also, please join us for our second layer webinar next week on feeding layers in production to achieve the 100 weeks by Shabir Abe from H&N International. So thanks again, Doug. Thanks, RJ, and see you next week. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you everyone for your participation.